Good morning and welcome to church. It is amazing to have you joining us uh, online as we continue to worship the Lord uh, together without being physically together. I want to mention here at this point that uh, tithe is a very important part of being a Christian and being a part of the church. And so I hope that if you are somebody who regularly attends this church via online or in person before the, uh, the shutdown took place, then I hope that you continue to give. And if you don't know maybe how to give or, or what online options there might be, uh, you can go to firstnazarene.ca and you can give there with all the options given to you. So you can take a look at that and that way you can be giving through uh, online ways as well. I just want to pray as we prepare our hearts to worship God, to praise God. So let's pray. Lord God, Savior King, you are wonderful. And we want to use this next 15 minutes, 20 minutes to just sing, to let our hearts raise up to you in joyful praise and worship. Lord Jesus, it doesn't matter where this is taking place. We could be looking at our tablet in our room or watching TV in the living room or on a computer or on our phones or, or wherever it is that it's happening. We can sing. You have called us to worship you in such a way. Lord, we love you. In your name, amen. Let us sing. Draw near to you, I will draw near to you. 
that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, always free. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died. This is the time in our service where we pray, where we just take a moment to be just God and us 
It is a moment where you can voice things that maybe you haven't been able to voice over the last little while or something may have taken place today that you really just need a private moment, just you and God. Maybe you just need to listen. Maybe you have done a lot of talking to God over the last little bit and it's time to just be silent and quiet and be with him. Whatever it is that you need to do, this is your time to do it right here, right now, just you and God. Let's pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Before we come together and pray as a, as a unit, as a family, as we like to say here as, a, as an ohana, I want to talk to you just for a moment. The times in which we are existing in right now are tumultuous. There are opinions about everything and everyone. Negativity seems to be everywhere, and positivity, well, it seems to be slim in the world in which we exist in. We are about to enter into a time in at least my history, and I'm sure yours, where students, teachers, other staff members of schools, administrations, they're all going to gather together to do school for the first time in a pandemic. And there's a lot of opinions as to what should happen and how it should happen. The truth is this, the church is not a political organization. It is a people organization. And those students and teachers, faculty members, administrators, everybody that does everything for a school to be able to function, well, they're people. And so they matter to us. And we want to love them. So what I want to do right now as a collective body is pray a prayer for the schools. Pray a prayer for the teachers, for the assistants, for the aides, for the secretaries and all the other staff members, for the administrations that are frantically trying to figure out what to do day by day for the students who are about to enter into a world that they've never been in before. We need to lift them up. So let's pray together. Lord God, we pray for the educators, staff members, administrators, anybody and everybody who makes school take place. Every single job within a school is of vital importance. And so, Lord Jesus, we lift all of them up to you now. Lord, opinions don't matter. Their hearts do. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that, Lord God, you gather around the hearts of all of those individuals who are launching into the school year, Lord Jesus, and hold them tight. Lord, may this be a year that 
for those who may not know who you are, that there'll be a turning point in their lives where they will call upon your name because they don't know who else to lean on. And for those who know who you are, who are leaning on your name right now, let them be a, a space and a place to, to land for those who are afraid and for those who are bewildered. Let them bring the love of who you are to those other people within their faculty, within their school, Lord Jesus. Let this, Lord God, be a year, not a year that is marred by upheaval, but Lord Jesus, a year where peace abounds within the school system as we collectively come together and honor you and who you are for everyone is our neighbor. Lord God, I pray for the students from the preschool all the way up to the grade 12, Lord Jesus, is going to be different for them and I pray for them. I pray that they will see within the eyes and the hearts of their teachers love and acceptance, a safe space to be. The Lord Jesus, that they will see within the eyes of their teachers and within the smiles that they, they will be able to see beyond the mask, Lord Jesus, and know this person, this person cares about me. Lord God, I pray for those students who are entering into the school system who believe in you and call you their savior, that they, Lord Jesus, begin to pray for their fellow student, that they begin to pray for a revival within the school system that will shake the ground in which we walk on, Lord, and that this will not be a time of hate, anger and the shaking of fist but a time of unity direction and peace as a ohana lord jesus we put our four voices together in one and we lift them to you our father our king our lion who fights for us. In your name, amen. All right, kids, let's talk. If you just heard the prayer that I prayed, it had to do with school, and, and that's kind of what I want to talk to you guys about. You're going back to school. Maybe some of you for the first time, maybe some of you, you're in grade one or two or three, four, five, six. This might be the last time that you're kind of a kid before you enter into junior high and you're in grade six right now. I wanna to talk to you just for a moment. School is gonna be different. I think you probably know that. I think probably your moms and dads and those who love you have talked to you a little bit about what's gonna take place and how things are gonna look. And, and I want you to know that we talked about some things over the last few weeks that I hope will help you. We talked about anger and that you're allowed to get angry, but it's how you deal with that anger and, and you need to deal with it well. If something that happens during school makes you angry, you need to deal with it well, with calmness, with peace. Maybe it makes you sad. Maybe something makes you sad when you go to school, and that's okay too. Remember we talked about it's okay to cry. And then you take a deep breath, and you go and you talk to your teacher. And maybe, <laughs> just maybe, you're super happy right now because you love school. 
And if that's you, awesome. Take on this year and go do things you never thought you could ever do. To all of you, we are very proud of you. We are honored and privileged to have you be a part of our family, part of this church. And we know that you're going to do great things in school this year. For those of you who are not going to school this year, who are not quite ready to even walk so much on your own yet, we love you too. We're praying for you because we know the future that you have is incredible. And we're so privileged to be a part of your world. Lord God, we love our kids. There is no, no doubt about it. We love them like crazy, and we thank you for them. They bring such joy to the hearts of the people within these walls when we can be here, and the people that are online and praying for them right now. We thank you. In your name, amen. Amen. Hey, church, so we are doing uh, somewhat of a series in just introducing you, if you don't know them, to our youth that are on their way to other places doing some amazing things uh, for God and for themselves as they are getting into secondary um, school. And so this is McKenna. McKenna, say hi. Hi. <laughs> McKenna has been part of our youth group for many, many years, but over five years anyway. And uh, she's been a part of our church family. You've probably seen her singing or in the back helping out uh, with the media team. She also went on the youth trip with us that we just took and did some remarkable work uh, with Tucson while we were there. And so she is on her way. Well, I'll let her explain it. So where are you on your way to? I am moving to North Vancouver to pursue musical theater at Capilano University. At Capilano University. And so there's a few of our youth group that are already yeah. there. Who's already there? Aiden Van Eyck, um, Vanessa Hodgins. Well, Simran doesn't go to Capilano, but she's there. there. Yeah. Nice. So there's a lot of students there. You know that uh, a lot of the students that attend our youth group are very much into drama and uh, the theater. And so... Uh, McKenna is one of them, and she is going to head to Vancouver. Now, I wanted to ask her a question uh, that I think is important, and that is, over the last year, where do you think that you felt God uh, moving the most in your life or in your world? Um, I think definitely on the mission trip when we met Crystal, who told us basically her story on how she came out from being homeless into getting her child back was really moving. and definitely gave me a new perspective. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we know that uh, when you guys take off that we don't have the same reach that we had before. We're not right there beside you to walk you through things or to help you. And that saddens us and we miss you, but we know that um, once you're a part of this church, you are Ohana and you'll always be a part of this church. And so we're gonna continue to pray for you and uh, there'll be people that will get your name and they'll be praying for you and know that anytime you need anything, we are here and uh, that we love you. And we're gonna pray for McKenna now as a church and kind of send her off with our blessing because when are you leaving for Vancouver? Um, Friday, so two days. In two days, she is fly <laughs> not flying, she's driving because <laughs> she has too much stuff to fly <laughs> to Vancouver, uh, where she'll be moving in with another girl who has come to our youth group. Uh, Maddie Morin and so she's been leaving there and they are going to enjoy the Vancouver life and all the rain that it brings so let's pray Lord God Savior King we love you we know that you have selected McKenna from the day that she was born to do amazing wonderful things in your name and so God we just pray for her now we know that once she moves away from here the the idea of having the church and having uh, us as pastors with her, Lord Jesus, to talk to, to work uh, problems out with. Uh, we're not going to be there physically with her, but Lord Jesus, we know that you love her more than we could possibly imagine. 
And we know how much we love her. So God, we know that you're going to be with her, that you are going to guide her. We pray that she doesn't uh, walk away, Lord Jesus, from the Holy Spirit and the guidance in which you are going to give, Lord God. There are moments like there is in all of our lives where uh, once we get on our own, it is tempting to kind of just stretch our wings and, and move forward. And sometimes that uh, that means that we don't hear you the way that we should. And I pray that McKenna's ears are tuned into who you are, that she will hear you and that she will follow you, Lord Jesus, that she will uh, be able to find a space and a place there where she can worship and love you and use the gifts that she was most obviously given uh, by you, Lord God. We thank you. We pray a blessing upon her now, Lord Jesus, that you will keep her from harm, that she will be safe, that she will learn so very much. And God, we also pray that in her time that there will be opportunities for her to share her faith, to share the gospel, to be able to tell people that there is a God and that Lord Jesus, she's, she's in love with him. In your name, amen. 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 <laughs> well, we're still in Acts. Acts chapter 17. We're going to be in verses 9 to 12. So Acts chapter 17, same chapter we were in last week. So if you uh, put any markers there or anything, you can flip right back to it. Uh, if it's on your phone and your tablet, I'll give you a minute to look it up so that you can find it. But we're in Acts chapter 17, verses 9 to 12. I'm going to start verses 9 and 10 is where I'm going to begin the reading. And then uh, we'll move on to verses 11 and 12, uh, where we'll kind of get into the heart of what we want to talk about here today. Acts chapter 17, verses 9 down to 12 is where we're going to spend some time. Starting in verse 9. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. Verse 10. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Verse 9. Jason has to pay a bond, uh, which shows to us perhaps that he is somewhat wealthy, and for sure it shows that he is an absolute dedicated member of this new church, this new way, and that he wants this mission of spreading the gospel to continue. Paul and Silas and Timothy, they, they agree to leave this space for, for three reasons. One, uh, because they don't want to stall the work of God and what is being done in other areas. They know that they have traveled a fair amount of of distance. They have shared the gospel. Things have gone well in some areas, not well in others. And so they know that there's more to do. And so they don't want to stall the work uh, by being in this place where they are completely and utterly unwanted. Uh, two, uh, they do not want to bring any more persecution to these new believers. These believers are, are brand new to the faith, brand new to what it is to follow Jesus Christ. And and they have a lot to deal with just in that personal relationship, that personal walk that they are building with God. And so to stay would heap upon them persecution from those who are in power. And three, to spare the money that Jason has put down. If they continue to be there and there's uh, a problem that takes place, though obviously Paul, Timothy, and Silas are not going to cause a problem, uh, but they might be accused of one. Uh, the money that Jason put up, the bond that he put up would be forfeited, and they didn't want to do that to Jason. And the truth is this, the Romans didn't care. They don't care about religion whatsoever. What they cared about was keeping order. And so they decided, listen, we need to know if there is some sort of chaos going on in this area, they're going to send in legionnaires. They're going to take over that space. Nobody wants that. And so that's why they kind of squelched things as quickly as they possibly could. Paul didn't get the time that he really wanted with the Thessalonians. It's why many believe that it is the very first letter that he writes is to these same Thessalonians to be able to talk to them and guide them and teach them a little bit more. 
However, whenever a door is closed, it means that another one is going to open and it is going to be amazing. Church, never be fearful or nervous of closed doors. Just keep praying. Paul and Silas and Timothy travel to Beria, a place that is ready for the message that they are bringing. And so we're going to go back to the word, and I'm going to pick back up in verse 11. I'm going to read verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 and 12. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Verse 11, I'm just going to read it again. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character. More noble character. The second part of that is what? They accepted or with great eagerness examined the scriptures every day. What an amazing compliment to have been given to these individuals. And it is well deserved. This verse displays an open-mindedness that they really hadn't seen in a lot of the areas in which they had preached and taught over the, the last several years. It is amazing how ready and willing they were to hear what was being said. And not just that, but then to go into the scripture to see if the words that Paul was preaching aligned with the scriptures in which he was dedicating all of this to. Uh, verse 12, every day they heard Paul. And they went intentionally to the scriptures to check the truth of this preacher. What an incredible message being sent to us by this first generation Christian. That we are generations beyond what they have done and yet they taught us so much. So I want to just take our, our points from this basic, just these two verses First is this, that God is smarter than us. God is smarter than us. By going to the scriptures, the Berea people show that they knew God was smarter. They knew that God was smarter than Paul, and they knew that God was smarter than themselves. Proverbs 3, 5 says, lean not on your own understanding. The reason it says this is because we are a limited people. When you think of all the things that we have done, it is minute. Think about it. How many watching or listening here have been to all seven continents? How many of us have visited the moon? Have even read a tenth of what's been written in the world? Have counted from one to a billion? I would venture to say that for sure, none of us have done all those things. And I'm pretty sure that pretty much none of us have done any of those things. So why then would we double down on our own understanding? Why would we lean on our own knowledge when our knowledge is a speck in the universe of knowledge? It would be insanity to rely on what we know to make accurate choices in our lives when it comes to the eternal. It, pure insanity for us to make accurate choices in our lives when it comes to the eternal. If we trust specialists in most of our physical and emotional needs, then why wouldn't we seek God, the ultimate specialist, by going through his word that was inspired by him, written by men that he touched 
and worked with so that they would be able to make those scriptures happen for you and for I. Why would we not lean on him as he knows everything in every area of the universe? We don't even know what tomorrow is going to bring, but God does. The Berea people chose well when they chose the understanding that God is smarter than us. Number two, to double check is faithfulness. To check Paul's message was a faith exercise that was very important. I want to take this idea, this double-checking idea, into the realm of science. Science is a place where there is a hypothesis given, and then the scientist must perform actions to double-check, to make sure that the hypothesis is right. Stephen Barr is a, a physicist. He's a, phys a physics professor at the University of Delaware, Ian Hutchinson, a professor of nuclear science and engineering in Massachusetts at the Institute of Technology there. And Richard Lindroth is an evolutionary ecologist at the University of Wisconsin. You go, well, Pastor, so what? Well, this is what? All of those men are exceptional scientists. And oftentimes we look at science and we say, oh, well, you see, science and God, they, they don't seem to, to mix. And I would say this, that all of those scientists are exceptional in their fields and all of their testimonies are similar to one another. They all start with God. That God drove their desire to be both odd and curious about the known and about the unknown. And however much they explored and however far they went into the unknown and all the stuff that they learned, the more that they went back to the word of God to confirm all that they were learning. They double-checked with the scriptures. They continued to go back to reading the word of God. From 1905 to 2005, Christians had won a total of 78% of all the Nobel Prizes in peace, 72% in chemistry, 65% in physics, and 62% in medicine. As modern Christians, we must take note from science and from the Berea people to check using the truth of the Bible. We sometimes as Christians look and think that science is just, is just over there. But these scientists and the Nobel Prize winners that I described, these people are using a double check method to go, yes, I want to see, I want to know more about what God has done in this world and I'm going to do that through science and then double checking with the scriptures to know that we're on the right path. To double check is faithfulness. Number three, trust God's word. Trust God's word. The Berea people showed faithfulness by using the scriptures as the true text in order to prove that Paul was right. Very exceptional that they were doing this. Yes, they, they went to a synagogue, which means that there was uh, a, a plenty of Jewish men there. There was obviously Greek men and Greek women as we know that they were saved. And so it was amazing that they took the scriptures because they didn't have the New Testament, just the Old Testament. And they took that Old Testament and they were able to check and look and go, yeah, I trust this book as the inspired word of God. And so in that, it will double check Paul. I trust this so now I can trust Paul. The other part of this is that Paul wanted them to check. He knew that he was preaching from the word of God and that he trusted God's word 
And he trusted that when they went to check that they would know that, hey, what he is talking about, what every preacher that you hear is talking about, hey, it comes from here. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947. And they dated back to 400 BC, which showed virtually identical to the Masoretic texts, which dated 1000 AD. This displays for us the understanding that the Bible is very, very accurate. The Masoretic text is the Hebrew Bible, which includes the Torah or the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. And it's very clear that those two, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Pentateuch, or the five books of the Bible, in which we use now, uh, they were identical. I'm sure that there might be a word or two that was a slightly different, but they were so close that we know this can be trusted. The New Testament has more numerous, more reliable, surviving manuscripts than any other book from antiquity. Antiquity means before the Middle Ages. This New Testament has been fact-checked. It is the Word of God. I want to tell you a story about a guy by the name of Sir Ramsey. He was an atheist, and he kind of wanted to prove the Bible wrong. So he picked the book of Acts. And he thought, okay, well, I'm just going to disprove the book of Acts basically by taking a journey to Asia and just showing that the places that Paul is talking about and what's taking place here, they're not, they're not real. He's just making up a story. But as he was going, he verified the names and locations of 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands. And they were exactly that were written here in the book of Acts. This atheist, Sir Ramsey, uh, became a, a faithful believer in Christ after discovering what he discovered through the book of Acts. There are 31,124 verses in the Bible. 8,352 are of a predictive nature or prophecy. That's 27%. 87% of those prophesied have been documented as fulfilled. The remaining 19%, there are events that haven't happened yet. And I guarantee you, they will be confirmed as well as time goes on. We can trust the Word of God. We can trust the Bible. Of all the world's religions, they all depend on works and following their teachings in order to gain heaven, or the equivalent of. Only one doesn't. Christianity is the only religion that not by works, nor by following the teachings of Christ, will we be granted heaven only by acknowledging that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose again, and is alive now. All of that that is our heaven ticket. I tell you that because you can trust a book. You can trust the Bible. Because the Bible isn't saying, hey, if you do all of this, you get this. No, it's saying everything that happens in here, everything that is talked about here is leading to the event of Jesus Christ dying for all of us raising from the dead and being alive now. And then everything that happens after that is hearkening back to telling us again and again and again the story of Jesus Christ. And so in that, it is not saying, hey, follow this and everything's gonna be fine. It's saying, follow this because it will lead you to the truth of Jesus Christ. The Bible is true. All this proves that God's word is trustworthy, is trustworthy. And so the Berea people did. And so should we. Listen, as a preacher, please, 
read with me when we're reading the scripture. When we're done, go back to it, reread it, look at it again, search your own commentaries, look at things. We need to be readers and listeners of the word of God. I know that there's a, there's a couple of guys in our church who are right now listening through the Bible, and that's awesome. If you're not a, a person who reads a lot or even looks and goes, I don't know, like it's hard for me. I read the words, but they don't seem to sink in. Maybe you're, you're an auditory learner and you just need to listen to the Bible. Do it. Get into the word. The word can be trusted. What these, what these people found was not another small G God or even another religion. The Berea people recognized truth, that it wasn't a crutch or a collection of stories. It was truth. There was this preacher who got on an airplane and he sat beside this individual and they started flying and this individual turned to him and asked, so what do you do? Because that's what we do when we meet new people. What do you do? And the preacher said, well, I, I'm a pastor. I, I, I preach in churches. And, and the guy kind of chuckled to himself and said, oh, that's just kid stuff. You know, like Jesus loves me, this I know. And the preacher kind of nodded his head and thought, yeah, I've, I've heard that before. He said, so what do you do? And the individual that he was talking to kind of sat up a little straighter with a sense of pride and said, I'm an astronaut. And the preacher smiled and said, oh, that's kid stuff. You know, like that song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. The Bible is not kid stuff. The Bible is not just a story. The Bible is true. After many came to the Lord, the envious brood of people came from Thessalonica and, and decided to take that party away from Paul and Timothy and Silas and, and push them again to somewhere new. So Paul leaves and he makes his way to Athens and he leaves Timothy and Silas behind to help these new believers in Berea. It is in it is of great need for those who believe in Jesus Christ to trust him and to trust the word of God we must become absolutely fluent in the Bible. It's okay to have favorite books, books that you love to read over and over again. But if you're a believer in God, this book It is the greatest book ever written. And we must know it. Because when we do, like Paul, we can use it to talk to people, to guide people. We can share our story and people can look back into this scripture and double check yeah, yeah, that's right. Before we do our closing song, I want to leave you with this. Every preacher that you listen to, church, whether it be me, whether it be four other services that you might uh, go to this Sunday because so many churches are online now, 
Maybe you have a, a favorite person that you like to listen to all the time. You love what he or she has to say. That's fantastic. I'm glad that you are diving in with all of that preaching. But if you're not double checking, if you're not looking back and going, are they continuing to follow God's word? Then you might be going down a path, even though it looks like a good one, that isn't good. Everything that you ingest into your eternity needs to come from God. And other than praying, the closest thing, the closest touch of the Father is through the Word. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. It is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is
yet not I, but through Christ in me. What an amazing line. What an amazing song. As, as I was singing along and just worshiping, this song is so beautiful. We are so blessed to be able to have men and women throughout Christendom writing music that is so exceptional, that keeps us grounded keeps us going back to the Father, back to the Word, back to prayer. Praise God. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you. I pray for an amazing week. It is going to be a different week for so many, Lord Jesus, uh, God, within our community. Lord Jesus, uh, Red Deer is about to, to go into the unknown, Lord Jesus, and we just pray. We just pray, Lord Jesus. You've got this. We know it. We know that there is nothing that we can do. It's just you. And through you, Lord, we can do things we can't even imagine. We love you, God. In your name, With amen. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home and day by day